Hey, welcome back to the Ping Pong Flicks Show. My name is Chris Wong. This is episode 358 of the Ping Pong Flicks Show. Thank you so much for tuning in to learn a little bit more about upcoming DC movies, DCEU, the Snyder Cut, and maybe I'll throw in a bits of Godzilla and Power Rangers whenever those come up. But mostly, this is a DC film-centric channel, so thank you once again for tuning in now the first things first there is a slight update to the matt reeves the batman movie apparently it's aiming to get cameras rolling on the batman by january 13th in london england now this news comes after the wake of the film actually adding a cinematographer to the crew that cinematographer is Robert Richardson. Now you may be wondering who is Robert Richardson. You have probably haven't really heard of him before, but I'm pretty sure you've heard of the movies that he's worked on. These include Inglorious Bastards, JFK, Hugo, The Kill Bill Volume One and Volume Two, Django Unchained, Aviator, Shutter Island. These are the type of movies that you've seen and you've probably witnessed his work. I want to kind of go into some of the work that he's done, especially the ones that involving like a detective type story. And that is one of my favorite movies is Shutter Island. The cinematography in that movie is exceptionally beautiful it is great especially when it gets into those imaginary dreamlike states the cinematography is absolutely great and i can't wait to see him transform that if at all into matt reeves the batman some even mentioned his work on how he gets silhouettes of the characters and those are also quite great as well including kill bill volume one where you are they're fighting in the tea house and all you see is silhouettes on top of blue and red imagine batman taking out people taking out thugs and all you see is a silhouette fighting left and right punching and kicking taking out bad guys it's going to remind you kind of like i don't know the spirit uh, back then uh that was a pretty good uh movie and it, that came after sin city it has that type of look to it when you think of stylish noir type of thrillers not to say that bat reese batman's gonna look anything like that but uh, having a great dp and and a cinematographer could actually work very well for his movie and so this gets me a little excited i mean it's no larry fong i mean in my opinion it's not none of these greater actor uh, um greater types of cinematographers and dps that at least has a lot of stylistic uh, approaches to them but it's not bad I gotta say it's not bad and if if he translates some of the greatest uh, cinematographer moments within these movies that he's made and put into Matt Reeves Batman then I think we're in for something pretty special with Matt Reeves the Batman now taking a look at Matt Reeves the Batman and seeing how he's talking about it's gonna be a noir it's gonna be uh, it's, it's supposedly set in the 90s although that's not really quite clarified yet um, but having it be a detective type story it makes you really wonder uh, how the route he's going to take and how they're saying it's going to be less action more drama more thriller more mysterious more mystery action more detective type storytelling and so i'm already thinking of him playing with the lights with shadows and lights and things like that to make it look a lot more like that noir type feel to it uh and, and it could just be me uh recently just watching some twilight zone episodes and seeing how they really didn't have much to work with then they so they had to really use utilize lighting and shadows to tell the story without much dialogue and i'm wondering could they really pull this off could matt reese really pull off the batman to be like that i would be certainly one would be certainly excited to see a this type of take 
on the Batman, rather seeing than the action-oriented Batman, the more brawly Batman, we're going to finally get a detective story Batman, one where he has to use, uh, to, to solve crimes, to actually do things beyond punching and kicking. Uh, so that is an interesting concept, and I'm really ready to watch that type of Batman movie uh, pretty soon. Uh, I can't wait to see a trailer or a teaser. Of course, that's not going to happen until next year, possibly the next San Diego Comic-Con, where he'll actually have some material to work with since he's starting to shoot in January. You would expect it to take several months. He'll probably have something to show at next year's San Diego Comic-Con. Speaking of cinematographers, Fabian Wagner, the cinematographer for the original Justice League Snyder Cut, released an image today, once again, just kind of pushing, egging Snyder Cut a little bit more, and we all have him to thank for that. Fabian Wagner posted this on his on Instagram, on set, still of the lovely... Uh, the Joe, the Morton, a true gentleman to work with Justice League. And Joe Morton, as you all know, played Silas Stone in the original Justice League Snyder Cut and also the theatrical version as well. But looking at the set, one could wonder if this is the point where he sees the janitor, where he's leaving the, um, the facility, or is this? Because you look at the blue line, it kind of wonder if this is the moment where he went to get to the mother box, right? And this is where the Justice League comes in. You see Cyborg and Cyborg uh, witnesses Silas Stone, his own father, kind of sacrificing himself within the chamber uh, of the mother box. So it makes you wonder which part is this scene at, uh, but it's great to see that Joe Morton gets recognized in a way, uh, and Fabian Wagner continuously sharing stills, behind-the-scenes stills of the Justice League. And, and a lot of these parts are of the Snyder Cut. Now, we don't have to wait until next year's San Diego Comic-Con for some new things uh, coming out for this year. We've got the Joker film, uh, and hopefully we're getting a trailer for Birds of Prey. Hopefully we're getting something for One Woman 1984, since Warner Brothers and DC are not going to be at Hall H this Saturday for this year's San Diego Comic-Con. So... I'm just hoping that they're going to show at least something, present something online, uh, like how It Chapter 2 showed something today, and now they're going to show the trailer online tomorrow. So I'm kind of expecting by Hall H, they should be presenting something online. If not, oh well. Missed opportunity, I'd like to say, but I hope they show something instead. But with SDCC coming out, take out the DC and all you're left with is SC. The Snyder Cut, release the Snyder Cut campaign is over at San Diego Comic-Con and they're really rolling with it. The Project Comic-Con team has successfully pulled up a billboard. They've got a bus wrap. They're gonna, there's going to be a... Plane flying overboard with a with a banner in the air. There's going to be handouts, boots on the ground. There's going to be a lot of that, including the L.A. Times, up apparently trying to follow one of them uh, or several of them. And the story about the Snyder uh, Snyder Cut release, the Snyder Cut campaign, and Project Comic Con. So there's a lot of that going on. Of course, a lot of that is actually attracting a lot more negativity to the movement. And that is very unfortunate because some people I even list, used to listen to back then, including Dennis Jang from Collider, he decided to attack the movement today on Twitter, actually saying that this is fan entitlement, this is nothing but a movie, you're just hiding all this suicide awareness and stuff uh, and when all you really want is the movie. So he's been attacking the fandom in general and the movement and 
that's fine. You know, whatever you do, you, uh, whatever you believe. But it is curious to hear this kind of stuff. And it kind of upsetting as well for a lot of people. I tend to try ignore it because there's no way you can change your minds at all. They've gone down the route of being feeling like they're elitist bigots. And so they're not going to change their minds. And that's fine. You do you. We do us. But it's kind of very interesting how people won't just want to change your mind want just want to feel like they're better than you you know they it's not like we tell them they can't eat a certain type of chocolate they can't eat a certain type of cupcake or we're saying you know that hot dog is it, you shouldn't eat that hot dog um because you're that's dumb you know we're we're it's it's so funny how people go out of the way to crap on someone else's what someone else wants it's it's very weird it's almost it really is like cyber bullying uh even though they want to take try they're thinking they're taking the the high road they're on their high horse really and they're actually crapping on, th on other people and feeling like they're doing a good job if you don't care about the Snyder Cut. If you don't even know, if you don't even want to be interested in it or anything like that, then why even bother going against something? You know, why even do that? And and at the same time, it's kind of hypocritical when they're, um, you know, saying negative things about our billboard, the release of Snyder Cut billboard, when they really had nothing to say to the rehire James Gunn. If you're going to complain about this, you have to be consistent and complain about that. Or then you're just being a hypocrite, right? I mean, that just makes no sense at all to me. And I don't understand why that is. Now, Stephen M. Colbert, who wrote an article for Screen Rant in regards to the release of Snyder Cut campaign over at, for Project Comic Con at San Diego Comic Con and what we're going to do and what things are going to happen, um, he actually wrote a great article about that. But he also also commented on Twitter today something that's very very compelling and something that I'm like saying exactly that is the point here he was talking about how people are kind of bundling up bundling up the release of Snyder Cut campaign with things like uh, um, you know get reshooting Game of Thrones season 8 redoing the last Jedi and doing other other things like that um, the sense in those things is that those things were made. Those things were like Game of Thrones season eight. There was only the the same creators made those. Um, that thing happened. The Snyder Cut. Something was made by an artist, and his name was Zack Snyder. Then, the studio took what he made, butchered it, and turned it into something else essentially changing that project into something else something that wasn't supposed to have been released something that wasn't advertised to begin with for the most part game of thrones season 8 was advertised as game of thrones season 8 there was no changes in creation there's no creators that changed that the last jedi came out exactly is still ryan johnson that made it you know, so it's hard to say why we would get bundled up with those two projects. Release the Snyder Cut is uh, ch uh, campaigning to get the original director who worked on his original work out to light because it was butchered by another artist, by a, cr a studio, a corporate team that came in, chopped it up, and tried to make a new movie out of that. And so that is essentially the difference between the, this movie and the other two examples a lot of these haters want to use to prove their point, when in actuality, it's not proving their point at all. It makes absolutely no sense. And then it goes into, well, it doesn't exist, and we don't have to go back into it. it doesn't exist we already know it exists and of course it exists uh, and uh, people have come out to say it exists Zack Snyder himself Jay Oliva um, essentially when I said Zack Snyder himself that really just takes out everybody else because he's the one who made it but they still want to go there and hopefully we continue to educate them uh hopefully in a positive way although they can get pretty negative in themselves being trolling themselves so sometimes it's going to be hard to get 
through to their thick skulls. But that's fine. Ignore them. But if we can get through them and have them change their mind, then it will be better off for it. Of course, that doesn't always happen, unfortunately, because they're pretty, you know, self-absorbed in their own sense. Um, they're, they've got that elitist feeling to them, and they don't want to lower themselves at any level to uh, to get off their high horse. But um, if they can, that's great. Then they're finally on their little way into learning of the truth about the Snyder Cut and hopefully accepting it and hopefully fighting for it uh, as that what it represents. It represents the uh, artistic, uh, uh, creative integrities. Uh, it represents a suicide awareness as well because Zack Snyder's daughter had committed suicide during that production. Uh, so it's a bit of it's a bit of that as well. There's a lot of different aspects of the Snyder Cut, and it's not just a movie. And I just like want to want to say it just one more time. Uh, Dennis Zhang, my God, what happened with this guy? I used to watch Collider a lot. I was used to be a big fan of them even uh, since AMC days. Uh, I think John Schnepp was probably the last of them to ever be uh, uh, one of the best of the Collider team unfortunately but this whole thing about fan entitlement you kind of want to look at your own team because really wasn't there one guy on team i don't know christian harloff who kind of cried a little bit over over live on collider that he didn't get to go to star wars galaxy's edge and he's been a fan he's been doing this for over five years or i don't know how many years he said he was uh and he didn't get to go to galaxy's edge look at that first before coming at the snyder cut movement about fan entitlement just saying dennis just saying well anyway thank you so much guys for subscribing and thank you so much for watching I'll see you next time.